Hey, how are you? Hey, good. good, how are you? Good. Where does Shelly sit? Oh, how are you doing? Hi. 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 Oh, hey. How are you? Here, alive. Yeah. How you been? I've been. I'm not awake enough yet. Oh. How are you guys today? That's all I good to see you again. Uh, things have been chaotic lately, unfortunately. Finally calm down. Oh, yeah, calm is always good. Even this is today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How about you, baby? It's good to see you. I didn't get to say hello the other night. Yeah. I was waiting back with you. That's okay. I had to come back because I left uh, my uh, Bible just sitting on the chair. Oh. I, I got halfway home. I was like, I'm missing something. <laughs> I think we've all left the Bible here before oh, yeah. and had to come back for it. Well, you know, most of the shoes. This one's left the shoes for the life, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> what time in the parking lot? I don't oh, really know. She definitely picked them up. She got in the car. <laughs> and someone drove up and said, hey, baby, just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little cutie. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I didn't notice we got home. She didn't have the shoes. Yeah, it's not like the chair a lot. Right. And I thought, I can't believe I walked out without noticing she didn't have the shoes. You know what my get by with? Uh huh. Her daughter, they had a heated garage, and it was like in February, but the garage was always really warm. And she, they were like for meeting, and she just ran out and jumped in the van without a shoe. She was like 10. It's warm. Oh, wow. Yeah, there was warm. But when they got there, it's like snowing, and she's like, I don't have any shoes. And her mom and was like, Most kids, they're so used to going around barefoot. Yeah. Especially in time. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. Uh, gotta find humor where we can. It keeps life going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, if you don't, it just drives you crazy. Yeah. I would say, if, you know, you can take a bad situation, it's tense, and if you can find the humor, then it's not so bad after all. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I forgot about that. If you don't laugh at yourself. All right, how are you doing? Nice.
Hey, Matt. How you doing? Hey, good. Hello. Carrie, Wolf, I'm Matt. I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. We have like 20 seconds to talk before it's yeah. done. Yeah. So let's get <laughs> No, I'm not trying to day off, and I figured, yeah. Not even. All right, I'll catch you later. Yep. Nice to meet you guys. Yep. Glad you're here. Thank you. Before we have an opening prayer, if you're able to, I invite you to stand. We'll sing together song number 135, titled Jehovah's Warm Appeal, Be Wise My Son. And we'll introduce our visiting speaker. Song 135. Our great God, Jehovah, we approach you this morning to thank you for all that you do for us. We appreciate this opportunity we have to worship you, and we ask that you please accept our worship as a grateful expression of our love and devotion to you. We appreciate being here this morning in order to be instructed, in order to learn about your righteous ways. We pray that we're able to uh, come to more fully grasp uh, all that you require of us, and we pray that we can also have your spirits so we can apply what we learn. We appreciate uh, very much having friends of uh, like mind and like faith with us. We appreciate the strength that we get from that. So we thank you for that provision. We pray that you bless our association together as we uh, work in inciting, encouraging, and, and showing love to one another. We pray too for our brothers and sisters around the world. We realize that some are undergoing difficult situations due to government op opposition. So we pray that you continue to strengthen them, especially our brothers in Russia with the, the difficulties that, that they're facing. We ask too that you be with our sp speaker this morning, Brother Miller, as he develops his theme. And we pray too that your spirit be with the Watchtower study conducted, Brother Olson, as well as our reader, as they highlight the main points of the spiritual food that we'll receive through the Watchtower. So again, we thank you for all good gifts that you give to us, every perfect present that comes from you. We pray for your blessing upon our meeting now, and we ask all things, thanking you, praising you in Jesus' name. Amen. At well, this time, please give your attention to Brother Miller for the late city. The theme you will develop this morning, how can you cope with today's crisis? Imagine the scene. We have a two-year-old child that's been developing well. They're excited about being a new parent. But then we notice things are just not developing for the child as we thought they would, as we feel they should. So we take the child to the doctor, and it's the worst news we feel. The doctor explains that the child uh, has a disease that uh, they will not be able to develop properly. That before long, uh, they will continue to see it in their health and eventually it will take their life. But he says there is some good news. How could there be any good news after that? Well, he explains that uh, if they as a parent take two to three hours a day and move the child's legs, and move the child's arms, and help them walk and move about get up and down. That they spend two hours a day, two to three hours a day, every day, that that child will gradually develop. They will be able to fight off that disease, not by themselves, but with the help of that parent. And that that child will actually grow, and by the year of uh, 18, 20 years of age, they will be able to live a full and happy life. But what would that parent say? What would you say? Huh. Doctor, two or three hours a day. <laughs> I'm a busy guy. I, I couldn't spend that kind of time. We wouldn't say that, would we? It wouldn't matter if we had to simplify our lives in order to take just a part-time job. No matter what arrangements we had to make, we would make it. Because we have that kind of love for our child. 
And you know, that's not just unique to Jehovah's people. <coughs> Probably most parents in the world would do that too, wouldn't they? Because there's that, that love for our children. See, we wouldn't even try to negotiate, would we? We wouldn't say to the doctor, well, what if uh, instead of moving their limbs slowly, could we cut the time in half a life? Done like that. See, we, we wouldn't try to negotiate it. Whatever it took is what we would give. Well, as servants of Jehovah, something that does make us unique is that we recognize that as important as the physical and mental well-being of a child is, their spiritual and moral well-being is just as important. In many ways, more important, isn't it? See, our goal is what is mentioned in uh, the third John, third letter of John. <coughs> it's a very familiar uh, verse to parents. And even though the Apostle John was probably speaking in regards to his those that he had taught the truth to and that helped develop spiritually. If that's true in regards to one's spiritual children, when you can combine both having literal children that we're raising to become our spiritual children, as it were, well, that's a double combination, isn't it? And this is our goal as a parent. 3 John, verse 4, no greater joy or the footnote, cause for thankfulness. Do I have in this, that I should hear that my children go on walking in the truth? I just picked that uh, number, spending two or three hours a, a day, an illustration that a doctor might give as a prescription. But the point is that it does take time, it does it? and effort to help our children develop spiritually and morally. Are we willing to take that time? We already said that if it was a physical matter, we would. As we mentioned, it's even more important in regards to spiritual matters and moral matters. You know what? Is that not just kind of over the top, though, when we have the title of this talk, How Can You Cope With Today's Crisis? After all, though, many young people have far more materially than you and I might have grown up with. They have uh, things that uh, we wouldn't have dreamed of. And yet, does that in itself bring happiness? Well, something that uh, is, a, uh, is really shocking in many ways. I know that several years ago, when I give this talk, we would state that it was the third leading cause of death among young people was suicide. Well, now it's not the third anymore. It's the second. Suicide is the second leading cause of death from ages 10 to 24 years of age. More teenagers and young adults die from suicide than from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, influenza, and chronic lung disease combined. That's a crisis. And we've even heard recently, because of uh, bullying or cyberbullying and, and different things, uh, young people taking their life. What about the morality in today's world among the youth? Well, it was, uh, here's some more statistics based on the 2013 Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance. It mentioned that over half, 53% of all students, grades of 9 through 12, indicated, and this is good news, did not yet have sex. On the other hand, 47% of high school students have had sexual intercourse. What does this lead to? Does it lead to happiness? And, and one more statistic that's rather shocking, and that is that uh, even those before the age of 13, depending on uh, which percentage you go by, anywhere from 5 to 10% of youth 
get involved with sexual activity. What has this led to? Well, while sexually transmitted diseases affect individuals of all ages, sexually transmitted diseases take a particularly heavy toll on young people. It is estimated that youth of the ages of 15 to 24 make up just over one-fourth of the sexually active population, but an account for half, just one-fourth of the number, but uh, accounts for a half of the 20 million sexually transmitted infections each year. It is estimated that one half of all people in the United States will have an STD at some point in their life. Again, isn't that a crisis? Yes, it is. So, when we're faced with a crisis, what's the first thing to do? Well, let's learn from uh, King Hezekiah. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 20. Now, we used that illustration earlier in regards to if there was a physical ailment of our child, the great lengths we would go to to uh, help them recover. Well, uh, if you remember King Hezekiah, if you, we pick it up there in verse 1, he's faced with life and death. Because in those days, this is King chapter 20, in those days Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came and said to him, this is what Jehovah says, give instructions to your household for you will die, you will not recover. The crisis. What does Hezekiah do? At that he turned his face to the wall and began to pray to Jehovah. Now we know in this particular case Jehovah miraculously interceded, but we can't expect that necessarily, can we? In our lives in regards to raising children or in regards to children being effective and growing to be on the side of Jehovah. But the principle of praying is important. Parents should make it a matter of prayer that we could be successful in raising our children. But then we must work in harmony with that. You know, uh, again, going back to that illustration of uh, if they had a physical ailment, we wouldn't look for loopholes as to how to get around helping them physically, right? I didn't would have to guess maybe 20, 30 years ago, and, and it's still a term that has become quite common, is the term that parents spend quality time with their children. Now some experts uh, say that that term was kind of coined maybe 20, 30 years ago by parents that had kind of a guilty conscience, not spending very much time with their children. So. Quality time was important. And what is considered quality time? Well, it's spending exclusive time with the child to teach them, play with them, and so on. Well, here's a, when a survey was taken, here is what working mothers were able to spend an average of 11 minutes daily of this quality time. And on weekends, 30 minutes per day. <clears throat> working mothers. Fathers, working fathers, spend around 8 minutes on weekdays and uh, 14 minutes per day on weekends. So this quality time. Well, you we might think, well, that's why I'm glad that uh, maybe a mother, not a working mother, or, or maybe a stay at home father. That's got to be much better. Well, the average for non-working mothers, instead of uh, the uh, 11 minutes a day, the non-working mother was able to spend 13 minutes a day. Quality time. Now, now, really, I'm not trying to minimize the importance of quality time. That's important, isn't it? Quality time. 
But isn't it true some things in life just take both quality and quantity? Say you come over to my house, uh, my wife, but we kind of have a tradition, she buy, buys the flowers and plants in the springtime and plants them and then that's my job to, to water them. She does a good job on her part. But, but say you came over to our house and you saw me out watering the flowers. And, and you know the nice thing, uh, the illustration has been used different times, that our children are like flowers, aren't they? Each one beautiful and unique. But so you come over to my house and I'm out there with an eyedropper. Putting a couple drops on each flower. You say, well, Jim, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm watering the flowers. You say, well, it's going to take a little more than that. I say to you, I'll have you know this is quality water. <laughs> Takes both, doesn't it? You'd be glad, you'd say, well, I'm real glad that it isn't tainted water, but it's going to take more. You know, God's Word makes very clear that it's going to take both quality and quantity of time to help our children grow in the knowledge and love of Jehovah. To grow spiritually, emotionally, and morally. Turn with me to a very familiar scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it starts off, and we often talk about this, but let's talk about it in a little more detail in uh, verse 5 where we're going to clean up our, our children and, and you know even if we don't have children or grandchildren uh, the principles that we're talking about today there's an application isn't it? because uh, we at times learn of uh, fatherless children either literally or spiritually don't we? today in the watchtower doesn't it mention that in certain circumstances we may be called upon to, uh, because of unusual circumstances, obviously, but maybe in the door-to-door -door ministry, we turn to visit Bible study, we find a young person, and the, the, the parents don't want to pursue the truth, but they allow the children to be taught. We might be in that circumstance, right? And so how can we help you, whether it's our children, grandchildren, or another young person that we're concerned about. Well, notice verse 5, it says, You must love Jehovah your God. This is the starting point. Don't start here. It won't work. It says, You must love Jehovah your God with your whole heart and all your soul and all your strength. So it starts in our own heart if we're going to pass it on to our children or to other youth. Uh, that's reasonable. Uh, maybe you've heard this illustration before. You know, if you've ever taken a, a ride in a commercial plane, the uh, individuals will always tell you, uh, in case there's a loss of cabin pressure and the oxygen masks come down, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put your own on first. Now, that may seem so. No, I'm going to do my children first. But it, it's good logical thinking, isn't it? Because if you're putting, starting to put theirs on and you pass out, guess what? No one wins. So you're assigned to get your own on first and then get your child's. And that's what Job is saying here, isn't it? Develop our own relationship with him, our own friendship, our own love. And then we're in a position to help others, whether it's our children or whoever we're trying to help. But now we get into where we were talking a moment ago about quality and quantity time. Because it says, these words that I am commanding you today must be on your heart, like we've already said, and you must inculcate them in your sons. And speak of them, obviously, and your daughters. And speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down 
and we get up. Yes, that's quantity too, isn't it? It's been noted that children do not do scheduling real well in regards to communication and, and sharing with you their inner thoughts. So again, if we assign, well, son or daughter, we're going to every night at 6, from 6 to 6.15, you can pour out your heart, and then we're done. Until tomorrow. Yeah, that's not the way it works, is it? See, any parent, uh, I know when we were raising our children, a lot of times the window of opportunity is fairly small sometimes. They come home from school, oh, dad or mom, i got to tell you what happened. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable to have to say, well, I hold that thought, <coughs> I'll get back to you in just a few minutes here. Sometimes that's just the way it is. But ask any parent that puts off that opportunity. <laughs> Well, I can't talk right now, but, but in an hour, we'll talk. So you get back to them in an hour, want to talk to them about it. And you know what quite often happens? Oh, never mind, it's not important. Or I forgot what I was going to talk to you about. There's that little window, and we needed to grab it right then. Another thing that this seems to be highlighting is that the more time we spend in doing a variety of things with our youth, the more the opportunities that they'll do spontaneously as we have conversation with them. Let us know what's in their hearts. And we've been warned as parents to try not to overreact. It's kind of a tendency, isn't it? But if our child says something, uh, uh, maybe some experience they had at school and they tell us what they did and it wasn't really the right thing to do. But if we panic and think, you did what? What happens to the conversation? It's all of a sudden ended, isn't it? Or it's very difficult at least. Whereas if we remain calm, say, well now why did you do that? But did it, any of your other classmates? We get the idea. And so as parents, uh, we recognize the importance of good communication. But you know something that's uh, even more important in communication, con conversing that way, is example. You know, a writer once said this, don't worry that your children never listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. There's a truth to that, isn't there? See, we can... We can express to them all about the importance of a relationship with Jehovah. But they'll be watching to see if we really are living up to, say, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, of seeking first the kingdom. We all recognize that family study night, family worship, we've all got that mark, don't we? And that's good. That's important. That's vital. But you notice that here in Deuteronomy, it indicates the truth would be a way of life. Something that children are very, very sensitive is about is uh, about is hypocrisy, or saying one thing and doing another. Now, no parent is perfect, and so we we readily admit that too, don't we, to our, our children? But see, if we tell our children on family worship night. That, well, this week it won't work because I've got some extra things to do around the yard or, you know, fill in the blank. And that, that's fairly common that, that we have excuses. But then when we decide that it's time, hey, tonight's family worship night, and say our, our children have, well, yeah, but I have this to do or I have that. See, we have to live with the fact that we have set the example. And naturally, we spent most of the time here today dealing with our responsibility as parents. But you young ones, you have the main responsibility as you grow, don't you, of developing and maintaining a, a close relationship with Jehovah. What can you do? Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. 
And these are some of the things that uh, we as parents can also review with our children, but for the next few minutes, we're especially talking to you, you, you young ones. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 9. Now, now we often talk about, whether we're talking to adults or children, be careful that the heart is treacherous. Don't, don't just follow your heart. And that's good counsel. But there's another side of this. Notice in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9, it, it almost sounds like just the opposite. To follow your heart. Now, so what is the point? Ecclesiastes 11, 9. Rejoice, young man or woman, while you are young. And let your heart be glad in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart. And go where your eyes lead you. But know that the true God will bring you into judgment for all these things. Yes, what the writer here, under inspiration, seems to be indicating is, you young ones, as you fill your heart of good things in Jehovah's ways, then, when your heart is right, you can follow it. As a the video we enjoy, jw.org, or broadcasting of the best way of life, right? And see, if, if a young person, if you become convinced that this is the best way of life, you can follow your heart, because it will lead you in that way. We recognize, that uh, you young ones, uh, we want you to recognize that the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. You know, the, the, quite often, uh, young ones like to uh, have the idea, well, I have to be my own person. I have to do my own thing. But notice in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. See, the truth of the matter is, someone and something will shape us. None of us are really a total island by ourselves. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 1 and 2, <clears throat> it says there, Therefore I appeal to you by the compassions of God, brothers, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, a sacred service with your power of reason. Now notice, this is good counsel for all of us, but you young ones, keep this in mind and stop being molded by this system of things. But be transformed by making your mind over, so that you may prove to yourself the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You young ones, as you think about it, are you more like young faithful servants of Jehovah, or do you more blend in with your schoolmates that are really not friends of Jehovah? Something will mold us. Our dress and grooming tells something about us, doesn't it? And see, this is your opportunity to get a good start. And how important is that good start? Well, notice in the book of Acts. And you young ones, you all remember about reading about Timothy, the young man Timothy. And even though, well, here, we'll pick it up there, Acts chapter 16, verse 1, he didn't have the, the perfect home setting, did he? When everything just fell into place for Timothy. It says uh, in verse 16, the B part of the verse, And a disciple named Timothy was there, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but of a Greek father, evidently an unbelieving father. And yet, notice, young ones, and he was well reported on by the brothers in Lystra and Iconium. You see there? You've developed a reputation. Even here in your congregation. Timothy had such a good reputation that even though relatively in his youth, later teen years, maybe early 20s, he was asked by Paul to become a missionary. 
Yes, he could follow the leanings of his heart. Because his heart was right with God. When we mentioned that the world would love to mold us, Jehovah wants and offers to mold us. But we will be molded one way or the other. You know, the world, like I said, that they often brag about, I'm my own person. So they get tattoos all over. And why? Because the ones they run with have tattoos all over. Is that really being oneself? I'm not getting into the idea of whatever an individual decides is what they decide. But the point is, someone shaped them. I had a Bible study some years ago. Uh, started a Bible study. Uh, big man. Truck driver. Biceps bigger around than my leg. And into that, as we started studying, I warned him, I said, you know, you're going to have some pressure individuals as they, they find out you're studying the Bible. But nothing, nothing bothered me. Good. Keep that attitude. Well, he attended a few meetings and the study was going good and pretty soon started to kind of fizzle out and I started questioning him. Well, he had started developing uh, resistance from his motorcycle buddies. Now this big strong guy that feared nobody backed away. See, he didn't want to admit it, but someone was molding it. Yes, uh, whether we're a parent, grandparent, just a friend, a family with children, or you youth, we can see that all of us play a part in the success of our children within our congregation. In summary, let's turn once again to two verses. Let's once again turn to that verse in 3 John. Because again, we emphasize this is the goal of we parents, grandparents, concerned adults. No greater joy do I have than this, that I should hear that my children, grandchildren, or fellow servants in the truth should hear that they are go on walking in the truth. But you young ones, I have a verse that I would like you to read. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 11. And it really ties in with the song that we started with this morning. Here this concluding verse is aimed right at you, you young ones. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 11. Be wise, my son. Be wise, my daughter. And make my heart rejoice, Jehovah's asking, so that I can make a reply to him who taunts me. May you answer Jehovah's invitation there. May you young ones not only cope with today's crisis, but exceed and uh, become resilient as faithful servants of Jehovah now and throughout the rest of your life. <coughs> advice helping you cope with today's crisis. Next week we invite everyone back here at the Kingdom Hall uh, for our meeting at 10 o'clock. Our public discourse will be given by Brother Larry Mills from the Lake City, Iowa congregation. His theme is Reach Out for the Real Life. So we'll look forward to that. This time we'll give our attention to Brother Olson as he transitions to the Lunch Center. Yeah. Welcome to the second part of our meeting this morning. Before we get into our Watchtower study, I'd like to stand once again. We'll sing song number 33. It shows them for us. Throw your burden on Jehovah. Song number 33. What a nice song to introduce our Watchtower study this morning. We're going to be talking about trials this morning. Anybody here not have trials? Well, of course, that's not the case, is it? We all have anxiety, we all have challenges, we all have trials we have to deal with, and that may be even unique to ourselves. 
But our theme of our, our lesson here that we're going to be talking about is Jehovah provides comfort in all our trials. Not just uh, some where he chooses and picks and chooses to where he wants to comfort us, but in actually in all of our trials. So we're going to be talking about uh, that uh, today, whether it's in regards to us as individuals, as families, uh, things that, uh, trials that they, what we go through, and we're going to see how Jehovah provides that comfort and relief for us. Uh, some of the questions here for review is, why can we expect that marriage and family life will involve some trials? How did prayer prove to be of comfort of some mentioned in the Bible? We're going to take a look at the example of Hannah, what a good example she was in, in, our, in helping us to imitate that as well. And what can we do, maybe even more importantly, to provide comfort to others? And so what a nice, uh, nice lesson to review and discuss this morning. So I invite everybody's comments. Uh, we'll read some good scriptures to highlight those main points, and, and we'll have a, a good discussion on how Jehovah can provide comfort for us. Uh, Brother Dowdy's going to read for us this morning. Uh, let's uh, get started paragraphs 1 and 2, please. A young girl oh, whom we will call Eduardo spoke of his concerns with Stephen and only Mary and Elder. Eduardo had been thinking about what we read at 1 Corinthians 7.28. Those who marry will have tribulation in their flesh. He asked, what is this tribulation, and how would I deal with it if I married? Before addressing that question, Stephen asked Eduardo to consider something else that the Apostle Paul wrote, namely, that Jehovah is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trials. Jehovah is indeed a loving Father, and He comforts us when we face difficulties. You may personally have had experiences in which God provided you with support and guidance, often through His Word. We can be sure that He wants the best for us, as He did for His servants in the past. All right, very good. So the question here on paragraphs 1 and 2, how does Jehovah comfort us in our trials, and what assurance does His Word provide? All right, let's start with Abraham, please. See what the Bible Jehovah gives us the four guys and show us what he wants the best for us. Yes, that's very true, isn't it? He does want the best. Sister Works. And it mentioned too in the past, uh, he did these things for servants. So that if we consider the, their example, it can be a very comforting thing. Yes, good. Let's take a look at our verse here to, to highlight here in Jeremiah chapter 29. In verse 11 and 12. Let's have that read, please. Sister Peoples. For I well know the thoughts that I am thinking towards you, declares Jehovah. Thoughts of peace and not of calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And you will call me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. What do you appreciate about this verse about Jehovah? kind of God he is, Sister Miller. I appreciate this verse. Yes, Jehovah is a loving, comforting God, but he wants something from us. And this shows us that we have to go to him in prayer and communicate with him so that um, he knows that we are in need of him and that he is aware of our needs. Yeah, good. Brother Holmes. I like the thought in the second paragraph there that says that uh, he provides us with support and guidance often to his word. So people in general might think comforting is something physical. I, 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 I have to have something physical to comfort me. Uh, but Jehovah has given us information. He has armed us with information about the future. He's told us about the paradise, about the resurrection. And so that comes to it. It gives us a spiritual assurance that Jehovah is a wonderful future for humankind. Yes, yeah, so, sir. Oh, sorry. Brother Holmes, uh, Brother Anderson. And too, tying in with Brother Holmes, that scripture in Jeremiah, he starts off in the first verse saying that he, he has thoughts towards us. And so he's already thinking, even before we pray to him, and those thoughts are conveyed by means of his word, the Bible. So oftentimes when we do pray to him, he's listening to us. He's already thought of us before we go in. Yeah, that verse is kind of like an invitation, isn't it, to invite us to, to come to him and pray, and we will get that comfort. So, uh, very nice. Let's continue with number three. 
Understandably, we are in a better position to cope if we can identify the causes of our problems or tribulations. And that is true of tribulation related to married life or to family life. What then are some of the realities that may bring on the tribulation in the flesh that Paul mentioned? What examples from both Bible times and our time can help us to find the comfort we need? Knowing this will help us to cope. So what questions will we address? What are some of the realities that bring on this tribulation in the flesh? And then what examples for both Bible times and our time can help us to find comfort? Yes, very good. So let's go, let's go into our first seven and year trials. Tribulation in the flesh, four and five things. We can read what God said near the start of human history. A man will leave his father and his mother, and he will stick to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Jehovah said that when he performed the first human marriage. Yet, under imperfect conditions, getting married and setting up a new household can strain family relationships. Usually, parental authority is being replaced by the authority of the husband. God authorizes him to exercise headship over his wife. Some new husbands and wives do not find this to be easy. According to God's word, a wife is to accept that she will be directed by her husband rather than by her parents. Relationships with in-laws may become strained and cause tribulation for the new leaders. New anxieties often surface after a wife announces to her husband, we are going to have a baby. Usually, a couple's joy over their prospective child is tinged with some apprehension about medical issues that may arise during the pregnancy or later. And there will be an, an economic impact to consider, both immediate and long-term. More adjustments become necessary when the baby arrives. The new mother's time and attention may be focused on caring for her child. Many a husband has felt left out because his wife is occupied with her duties toward their baby. <coughs> on the other hand, a new father has new responsibilities to shoulder. His duties increase because he has a new family member to care for and provide for. So what are some causes of tribulation in the flesh? <coughs> Is a lot of times sisters are moving right out from their parents' household into their new household, and they're used to their parents' authority, and now they need to listen to their husband's authority. And so both the husband and wife can sometimes find that difficult, and it also sometimes strains the relationship with their in-laws. So that's some tribulation. Yeah, very true. Sister Words. We've heard the term sometimes of uh, dreaded mother-in-law or something like that because they stick their nose in or they probably shouldn't in the young couple's uh, affairs. So it's good for par parents of the children that are married to uh, let them live their own lives and if they can help in a way that isn't uh, obstructive. Thank you. What does Romans 3.23 help us?